share the uh, screen with her presentation for us. Uh, Dr. Frankie has for many, many years been a professor of entomology and a student of uh, native pollinators uh, from his uh, group at UC Berkeley. Um, and in fact, uh, when my daughter was um, between uh, high school and college, uh, she worked for him for a summer uh, collecting bee specimens uh, around Berkeley and in the Central Valley. So uh, his name has been familiar, with, at least in our house, for quite a long time. And uh, we welcome our speakers. Thank you. It's nice to be there. Can you hear me? We can. All right. Well, let's. I'm going to go through a few slides, and if for some reason you can't hear me, we'll need to do something about that. So um, I'm going to start with an outline. I'm going to talk a little bit about the diversity of bees, importance of the bees. Um, can we go? Let's see. Okay. First of all, <laughs> all right. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about decline, how to help the bees, what we do in my lab, and then um, gardening for native bees. So I'm going to be talking mostly about an overview of the native bees, uh, primarily of uh, the temperate regions. And I'm going to insert a few things here and there about bumblebees, which I was asked to do, although it isn't my specialty, but there are some things that we can say about them that I think are important. So um, we'll start with the, a look at the um, bees, wasps, and flies. I'm sure all of you know what the differences are, but just a quick overview. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, we can, and we're all muted. How did Rocky shot go? Well. Fine. Doing that. Okay, Sarah. I guess I, I guess they can hear me, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I, Gordon. I think everybody can hear you. Um, uh, maybe people can let us know in the chat if you don't hear him. But otherwise, um, I think you're okay. Okay, well, let me quickly mention a few quick things about bees, wasps, and flies. I think most of you probably know these things, but there's some general things that uh, we always like to tell people, and that is bees are vegetarians, wasps are carnivores, and bees and wasps both have two pairs of wings. I'm sorry, somebody said something. I don't know what it was. Okay, Gordon, let's go to the next slide. Gordon, you're doing a great job. I think everybody on this um, should mute themselves. Please. Can we go to the next slide, Sarah? I'm only hearing pieces of words. I'm not hearing complete sentences or complete um, inform pieces of information. So if you can hear me, then I, we can go forward. But otherwise. I think maybe somebody accidentally unmuted. I think maybe somebody accidentally unmuted. So I think you're okay to keep going. And if it's okay with everyone, we'll just keep going and take questions at the end. Um, Dr. Frankie, I might suggest that you turn your the video off on your computer uh, because it may be hogging bandwidth, which causes um, halts and stuttering in the uh, uh, communication. And if all the uh, bandwidth goes to your voice, things should go okay. We can see uh, Sarah's uh, pictures and you can comment on them. All participants should turn off their video and mute, and they should mute also. Um, 
Dr. Frankie, you're uh, muted right now. Uh, your video is on, but your voice is muted. Okay, is are we <laughs> making any contact with anybody? I'm, I'm talking now. We can That's hear great. you now. Okay. So, I'm not going to labor this thing about the bees, uh, the, the anatomy. I'm going to try to keep going here if I can. Um, I'm going to I'm going to move on. I think all of you know about the honeybee and its parts. So how many bee species do we have in the world? Well, um, let's start with California. We have about 1,600 or more species of bees in California. In the United States, we have about 3,600. And in North America, which includes Canada, 4,000. Worldwide, rough conservative estimates are 20,000 plus. Most people think that we have probably about 30,000 species of bees in the world. And a lot of these bee species have not been identified yet. And they're from primarily from uh, Asia and some from South America as well. Next. So there's some common bee myths that uh, I think that I like to always mention. And that is that um, I think you can read these. I'm going to let you read these because if there are any questions about this, I think I'm talking to people that really know all these things to begin with, but I want to make sure you, you know one thing, and that is the only bee that we have in North America that makes honey, that is honey that we can commercially uh, extract, is the honeybee. Now in Central America and throughout, throughout other parts of the world, we have stingless bees. They also make honey. They also sell it commercially. It has a very different flavor, but a lot of people like those bees because they're small and they don't, they don't sting. They're stingless. So um, let's move on to the next one. We have generalist bees and we have specialist bees. And the generalists are the kinds of bees that can take any kind of flower. They're not restricted. But specialist bees are those types that have um, a certain relationship that they have to have met with particular plants that they're going to be visiting. That's primarily concerned with pollen because they will take nectar from other plants. But there are things like sunflower bees, squash bees. These are very considered to be specialists, that, that they take only certain pollens and not others. So here's a few groups of bees. Uh, the mining bees, these are the andrenids that come out in the springtime only. Uh, you can see them right now. They're just beginning to tail off. But these are really beautiful little bees that um, visit flowers. You can see them readily. There's a few groups of bees that visit only at this time of the year. This is one of them, the andrenid or the mining bees. Olipus mellifera, I think you all know, so I'm not going to spend much time on that one. Next slide. So the bumblebees. Well, everybody's interested in bumblebees these days because they're one of the big, big spectacular bees that are out in good numbers. And um, we have the common bees that we see around, which is the one on the right side is the yellow-faced bee. And then there's the black-tailed bee on the left side. Uh, Bombus vazesneski is the one on the right. And it's very common, especially on poppies but also goes to other plants as well. The one on the left is common now on a lot of different flowers. And this is the Bombus uh, melanopigus. So a little bit smaller, faster flying. Uh, the larger yellow face bee is slower and is easier to follow. There are 27 species of bees, in, bumblebees in California. So uh, we, we're very rich with um, with bees, bumblebees in this state, just like we are rich with native bees overall in the state of California. Now, one, I, there's one comment I want to make quick like before I forget, if we can go back to that last slide. 
uh, oftentimes we get comments about, well, we know pesticides bother bees and other things. What about herbicides? And we're always hesitant to make too many statements about herbicides and their effect on bees. But very recently, there's been a number of papers out indicating that um, herbicides are, are con considerably toxic to bumblebees. And this is the first good set of papers we've had out recently in the scientific literature about this fact. So from now on, when people ask about herbicides, well, we're just going to have an answer that will be based upon these new studies that are coming out. So herbicides can be a problem if they're not used properly. Diversity of bumblebees. Um, maybe some of you probably know this from the pretty fine book that um, was produced not long ago in 2014 by a number of authors. Robin Thorpe was one of them. Robin Thorpe used to be uh, work with us a lot, and then he had an un, untimely passing away. Uh, but um, in this book, they tell quite a few little factual pieces of information about bumblebees. Worldwide, we have about 250 species. In North America, 46 species. And in California, about 27 species. Now, interestingly enough, about half of these bumblebee species are endangered. So I think you've all heard about some of the some of these species, such as the Franklin, Franklin bumblebee and some of the, the rusty patch bumblebee back east or in the Midwest. But um, the bumblebees, it's very interesting when you look at the literature on bumblebees, how little we really know about the, about the uh, biology and ecology of a lot of species. And that goes for a lot of native, native bees as well. But we do have a lot to learn yet about bumblebees. And that's brought out very clearly in this book. Here's the yellow-faced bumblebee, Bombus vasneseskia, and it's uh, uh, one of the most common bees out in springtime. It'll be out all year round, but com commonly coming out at this time of the year. Bombus californicus uh, looks a little bit like the um, yellow-faced bumblebee, but it has a black face, so that's easy to recognize when you see that. It has a little bit of different behavior also. So, and then we have Bombus uh, melanopigus, the black-tailed bumblebee. This is really common right now. In fact, this is so common that it comes out, it starts its seasonal activity in the middle of, in the middle of December. And I always ask people, have you ever seen um, what flowers is in the middle of December? Because these bees are out collecting. And most people stumble and fumble. And finally, someone says, Manzanita. And I said, that's it. You win. So Manzanita is out feeding a lot of these bees in, in cold times of the year, actually. Now, these here's some of the other small bees that are that are not very obvious to, to those of you who haven't looked maybe very closely. This is a small carpenter bee. And it's, a, it's about maybe a little bit more than a half, many more than somewhere between a half an inch and two thirds of an inch long with a very slender body, but very effective pollinators, very effective at gathering pollen. And they have a wide variety of hosts. So it's a really good little bee that's out there doing a lot of work for us. And it's common in agricultural areas and it's common in urban areas right now and it'll be common most of the year. There's several species. So um, it's one to keep your eye on if you haven't um, had a chance to look at them. Um, small carpenter bees. And it behaves a little bit like the bigger carpenter bees, which you're very familiar with. So um, it hollows out little stems with pith, and it makes its nest inside little hollow stems. This is a sunflower bee. This is one of the specialist bees that we have. Very fuzzy guy, a lot of hair. You'll notice that being very different uh, among bees and versus wasps. Wasps don't have a lot of hair because they don't do a lot of pollen collecting. In fact, they don't. They, they visit flowers for nectar. Um, so this is the kind of bee that you would see in a pick, prick, prickly pear. If, um, if you see a clump of cactus around and you see little uh, yellow flowers, they're beautiful flowers, uh, you'll see bees hopping in and out of those flowers. Most likely, it's this bee. 
Now this is the Melisodi species, longhorn bees. This happens to be a male, and the females have a little bit shorter antennae. But the males are really common, and they'll be out very soon. And um, they're very common on members of the Asteraceae, the sunflower family. So it's a beautiful little bee, jumps around a lot. It's got some great stories associated with it. Next slide. Now, just, as, just like there is with other animals, we have such things as called cuckoo bees. And we even have a, a cuckoo, a bumblebee. But Zermolecta is one of the cuckoo bees. And there's quite a, quite a number of these uh, bee species in the world. And we have a lot of them in California. And they basically make their living by somehow invading the nest of other bees and capturing all of the resources and putting their own, their own uh, offspring into, the, into those resources. And they take over and basically kill the, uh, the, the uh, occupant of that particular nest. So these are, these are bees that are just part of the whole system. And in fact, uh, we actually use them as indicator species. When we see collections from an area, then we see uh, cuckoo bees like this one and a few other species. Uh, this sort of indicates to us that this uh, composition of species in this area and the community of bees in this area is probably pretty healthy overall. When you see a combination of um, different kinds of bees together, including the cuckoo bees. Carpenter bees. Well, these carpenter bees, uh, here's a beautiful one uh, showing, visiting a, a salvia flower and getting sprayed on its back with lots of pollen. Take a look at that. All that white material that's being laid down on the back of that bee is all pollen. And that comes because the female's got her head into the flower and, with, and she's going after the nectar. Some of, these, some of these carpenter bees are extremely long, big, large bees. A lot of people are afraid of them. They're generalists. Uh, you see them commonly on salvia plants, wisteria, and um, they are, they're really successful bees. Although a lot of people get excited about them when they see them because they drill holes in wood. Uh, to our knowledge, there has never been an, a barn or house collapse because of in, an infestation by these guys. I always, I always tell people if you see them, uh, watch them for a while. They're really interesting. You'll have fun watching them. And if you can't stand them or there are too many of them, well, put some little uh, little chunks of uh, steel wool in the holes and that'll slow them down. But whatever you do, please don't use pesticides. I hate these articles where they talk about this compound and that compound will get rid of your carpenter bees. Please don't do that. Next slide. Now, carpenter bees don't have very long mouth parts. So they've adopted a different strategy for getting nectar from flowers. This is a red flower, which is not characteristic of bees, bee flowers. Uh, this is a flower that would be visited lar uh, for the most part by something like a hummingbird or maybe a butterfly. But this bee has figured out all it has to do is poke a hole in the base of the flower and it can suck out the uh, nectar. And that's what it's doing here. Now, bumblebees do a little bit, little bit of that as well. Uh, not like the not like the carpenter bees though. They're really experts at this. They'll just slice a little hole, and they'll start removing the nectar. Now the bee that I just showed you is a female, but most people, or at least people that haven't looked very well, uh, will also be astounded when they see this bee on the left side, which is the valley carpenter bee male. And it's actually called the teddy bear bee. So uh, this is a big bee. And its main function is to mate with the females. And you can just go along and you see them visiting the flower. You can grab it with your hand. Or if you have a net, you can scoop it up. You can hold it. It won't bite you and it won't sting you. So we actually use this as a teaching tool for people that are not very familiar with bees but want to see something like this thing, which buzzes a lot. It doesn't really like to be handled. But it's so fuzzy and very cute. Um, the Australians are, are fascinated by these bees. They have a lot of websites where people describe activity of these bees. In fact, in California now, when people get familiar with this bee, um, they'll write to us and they say, what can I plant so I can attract these beautiful teddy bear bees? And of course, we tell them what we know, and then uh, it's up to them to do that. Um, there's the other, other carpenter bee that's out here, a little bit smaller. 
Xylocopa tabaniformis, um, and that's the one of the bees visiting the flower right there and going after nectar and um, making a good visit. Next slide. Now here's a very small group of bees called Hyleas. These are masked bees, and they always have yellow on their face. And uh, these are tiny bees, and they have a really very special way that they carry pollen. Uh, most of the other bees carry it on their legs or on their belly. This bee ingests the pollen into a special sac as part of its um, digestive tract. It's called the, um, let me see if I can remember the name of this. This It's, it's a small, um, Sarah, do you remember the name of that special sac? Do they call it a crop or is there another term? Uh, the crop is, is close enough. And they take this uh, pollen into the crop and they hold it there. Then they bring it back to the nest and they'll regurgitate it into the nest. Now, if you notice the hind legs and the belly of this bee, you can't see any hairs. So all of the collecting of the pollen is taken internally and in, into the crop section of the digestive system and then it is regurgitated. So this is a really interesting little bee, very small, tiny bees really, uh, but also very effective pollinators. Now I'm gonna stop for one second and give you a quick definition of what, what is a pollinator? Well, a pollinator really is an, an insect or in this case a bee. And uh, to be a good pollinator, you have to be, get yourself contaminated with pollen and uh, the, the act, of, act of pollination or the act of, um, uh, act of uh, pollination really is the act of contamination. If you can carry pollen in some part of your body, like bees do it very effectively, and other insects can do it as well, then you can be an effective pollinator. So when you think about bees, what they're doing, um, think about the fact that they're actually transmitting pollen in some way. Even if, it's, even if it's not a very much, but if they're fe effective in moving it around and there's enough of them moving it, uh, they can be considered pollinators. Now, Agapostomin is a bee that I always like to point out to everybody because uh, we, re we name this bee the ultra green sweat bee because the females are so beautiful. They are metallic green all over, including the eyes, and the males are um, metallic green on the head eyes and thorax, but the abdomen, look at it, it's striped. And this is one of the, the few really common native bees of California that people are beginning to recognize more and more frequently. When I give talks, I used to give talks you know, several years ago, and I'd, every, I'd always ask people, have you ever seen this bee? In an audience of 30 or 40 people, <laughs> uh, no one would say much. And then, then suddenly, a couple of hands went up, and recently more and more hands are going up, so people are beginning to see these bees. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that bees in general are, are on people's mind because we need bees, and bees are being in the news about uh, losing pollinators worldwide, and especially in the United States. Honeybees are being impacted uh, for, way, for a variety of reasons. We'll get to that a little bit later in the talk. But I like to call out this bee to people and say, you should look for this bee. It's everywhere. And it, it's operative during most of the year. And um, it has an interesting reproductive cycle, which I don't think I'll have time to tell you about. But the main thing is it's a ground nester, and the females are this metallic, beautiful, ultra green bee color that uh, you can't forget once you see it. And they're generalists, fortunately. And they're, they're out collecting pollen and nectar from a, a wide variety of different plants. Next slide. Uh, these are small bees, uh, lazy glossum, also sweat bees. And there are a variety of these little bees. And most people, when they see these, think that they're just a small little fly. But they're not. They're a little tiny bee. And they carry lots of pollen. Take a look at the one, the lower portion of your uh, images here. Look at all the pollen on its hind leg. So sweat bees are really very important also. The other interesting thing about sweat bees is they're very common. And many of them are ground nests. In fact, most of them are ground nesters. And you can probably have these in your backyard if you don't have a lot of mulch on your, your plants. Uh, you can see them nesting. They, they tend to nest 
as a group. They're not, they're not um, many of them are solitary, but some are semi-social. So uh, this is a really an interesting bee to keep your mind, eyes on. Now, if I was giving this talk in person, I would have specimens of these so that you could all see them. But uh, you'll have to bear with us with these incredible photographs that my colleague, Dr. Roland Coville, has taken. Uh, he's an expert uh, bee photo insect photographer, and especially bee photographer. Okay, let's see what we got next here. Anthidium, the Will Carter bee. This is a really interesting bee. It was introduced into the United States. It's actually from Europe. And it collects pollen on the other side of its abdomen. And uh, the females use their hairs to scrape uh, leaves. And they, they scrape the fuzz off of leaves. And they use it for nest building. And it also chases a lot of other bees. <laughs> the males do anyway. And it's very territorial. And it sets up on certain plants and chases everything around. But uh, the females, on the other hand, have other business to take care of. And that is to um, look for this hair on the plants, scrape it off, and use it for nest building. Now here's one of my favorite bees. This is um, a leafcutter bee, and it's Megacali fidelis. And if you take a look at the underside of the abdomen, you can see all that yellow. That's pollen. We're just going through systematically debunking some of the other Are we okay <laughs> with, with sound and everybody? Can everybody hear me, more or less? I'm gonna take that as a yes. Okay, here's here's a leaf cutter. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, Sarah, I wanna check with you for a second. Can you hear what I'm saying pretty well? Yes, Gordon, I can. I'm sorry, is this the right side? Yeah. Yeah, this is the right slide. I just want to make sure that you can hear me. Okay, so here's the leaf cutter bee. Next slide. <coughs> and it's doing what it's, next slide. It's doing what it's supposed to do, carrying a piece of leaf that it's cut from a plant, transporting it in midair. And then it's up on the upper um, right side, you see the leaf being hauled into a hole. And then it is fashioned into a little packet of leaves that are held together by, by various kinds of uh, secretions that the insect makes to hold it together. And then the pollen is put inside these uh, chambers or these little these areas that are fashioned out of leaves. And then the egg is deposited and it's closed off. And you can see the one at the bottom there, the number 14, uh, that's where it's closed off. So then the Female goes away and either makes some more nests or she dies. And then the cycle starts again the following year when the bee comes out, uh, it'll come out of there. But the, the neat thing is to watch these things, watch these bees when they cut these leaves. And there's just such experts that's slicing off a chunk of leaf, grabbing it and flying away with it. Then we have mason bees. Now these are little small bees that come out. This is one of the groups of bees that comes out uh, only in the springtime. Um, so you have to be watching. They're, they're out right now and uh, soon they'll be gone. But um, these are medium sized bees. They actually have a round head, sort of a roundish thorax and a roundish abdomen. And uh, they come in various colors, uh, dark metallic blue, uh, green, copperish. Um, they're solitary nesters in wood cavity. They use mud or they use chewed leaves to build their nests. And one of the other interesting things about these bees is some of these bees are extremely important in agriculture. Um, but they need certain conditions. For example, they need to have mud. That is one of the species, one of the best species of all, needs to have mud. So sometimes people will go ahead and buy large quantities of these things in the pupil stage and then they hold them and they let them go and they never see them again because once they do their job uh, they don't they need to have a place where they can make a nest and they need to have mud so if you don't have mud and you want this bee to do some work for you in the agricultural area uh, you've got to provide it with nesting materials and mud is one of them So what do bees do? I think everybody knows what bees do. Um, 
They're extremely good at pollinating. That's what they're designed to do. Uh, over 100 main crops worldwide are pollinated by bees. If we didn't have bees, we wouldn't have very much diversity that we have. Uh, so bees are really essential for keeping ecosystems biodiverse and keeping plant life balanced properly. So can't say enough about how important bees are. I think this message is getting out to people as well, that bees are extremely, an extremely important part of their lives. Agricultural importance, well, it's pretty obvious. A third of all the food that we eat is pollinated by bees. And a huge number of the crops that we have are um, insect pollinated. Um, you can see a number of things down here that uh, we know that are important for, for from plants that we get, medicines derived from plants. The other thing that I would mention to you is that if you, those of you have had the opportunity to watch bees in a greenhouse or even in your backyard, they do a special kind of pollination, which is called buzz pollination. And in this, in this situation, they grab the anthers and they vibrate them with their wings. And this causes the pollen to be released from these tubular holes that are in the anthers. And then they come out and they pack the pollen and take off. And only the bees in California, that is, that is in the new world, can do this. Honeybees can't do this. But honeybees make up for it sometimes because they can go out and they can scrape up pollen that the, that the other bees have missed. So they actually can do a little bit of pollination, but not buzzing. They don't have that capacity. So if you have a chance to watch tomatoes, eggplants, or peppers sometime, take a look at the anthers, the way they're arranged in the flower. There'll be a little hole at the tip, a little micropore. And that's where the pollen comes out once the bee shakes the, the, um, the flower. So decline of pollinators, this is a very big deal these days. Um, let me just say that in general that bee populations are declining around the world. Um, honeybees are no exception, they're declining. We don't have all the answers, but we have a few. Um, we're, we're seeing a dramatic decline in insect pollinators and especially in bees. So this is a very serious problem that we have ongoing at the moment. And the reasons for this decline, I'm going to get into those a little bit here. Habitat destruction, where we just remove the habitat. If you remove the habitat, uh, they don't have a place to nest. They don't have a place to uh, get their food and nest. Also, habitats that are fragmented, they're spaced apart. This is not so good. And of course, Pesticide use, I think all of you, and there's no sense uh, hammering away at pesticides. They are, they're designed for one thing, and that is to kill. But they also kill bees. Now, climate change is another problem that we have. It's huge. Um, changing climate causes cycles of, of flowers and bees to change. And we're just beginning to realize and begin to document how these changes occur. We don't exactly know why they occur the way they do, but the patterns are beginning to form up that plants become unsynchronized with their pollinators. Plants sometimes hold back, particularly in drought years. Um, so we have a lot of things happening with that we can uh, uh, associate with climate change. And most of these things are negative. Introduced species, we have some species that push out other species. And then, of course, we have uh, lots of problems still with disease and mites. So uh, these are the issues. How can you help bees? Well, don't use pesticides, please. Uh, preserve as much native habitat as you possibly can. And uh, revegetate areas with uh, proper plants. And create pollinator, I'll go back, <laughs> create pollinator gardens. Now, this is one that we established in San Luis Obispo years ago. And we sampled the, the garden area. There's several gardens in this one community garden. And we only found six native bees there. Uh, we got people to stop using pesticides and we got them to introduce plants. 
ones you see in the foreground are mostly the ones we introduced. And within uh, two years, we had at least 40 species of bees that were regularly visiting this particular uh, garden. But here's another interesting side story. You know, wherever, whenever you start messing around with nature, um, things, things begin to happen you don't plan on. For example, we started getting a lot of bees and people were beginning to see the bees. And they were also noticing that a lot of birds were showing up. A lot of these birds are insect eaters. So we had to train the people and educate the people to scare away blue jays and mockingbirds and everything else that would eat a bee. So um, if you create a garden, it's going to be a habitat. That's something that you have to be prepared to explain. So our lab at the Berkeley, at Berkeley, uh, we do a lot of things. I can just give you a couple of items of what we do. We create these gardens. This is a garden we created that you're looking at in the middle. Uh, we have a plant area where we grow a lot of plants, and then we transport them to the field, and we have cooperators. This happens to be adjacent to an avocado orchard in Southern California in Ventura. And uh, if you look at the bees on the right side, these are the bees that are also visiting avocado flowers that are also visiting the plants that we planted. So we select the plants that share something with the avocado flowers, and that is they share the same bee pollinators and other kinds of pollinators such as flies and wasps and even a few beetles. So gardening for native bees, how do you do this? Well, you have to remember what bees need. They need food, pollen and nectar, um, and they need a place to nest. So we, they also need something else, and that is something that people may forget about, and that is if you're gonna create a garden for bees, you need to be thinking about plants that will flower all year long. And here's some of the things that we recommend and we're going to show the uh, show the list of these things. Lilac is a really good early season flowering species. Wisteria, manzanita, Prida madera. Now, not not everything we use is an is a native, and that's because we let the bees tell us what they want, and then we plant it. Prida madera is an echium species from from uh, the old world, but it's a fabulous plant that's in flower right now everywhere, and it's very good for a wide diversity of bees. The wisteria is probably only good for carpenter bees. The big black carpenter bees love this thing. Manzanita attracts a lot of different kinds of bees, especially in the early part of the year, December, January. California lilac now is in full flower and just beginning to phase out a little bit. Other things that you can plant, buckwheat, really easy plant to plant, gum flower, uh, phacelia, uh, if you plant facility, be careful. It's got little spines, but it's also a super good plant for bees. Lavenders, some lavenders are very good. Others just are, look pretty. Uh, catnip, this is a good one. Um, and also some of the sages, like the Brandigii sage, is outstanding. If you water it and take care of it, it'll produce a lot of flowers and make a lot of bees happy. Good nectar source. California poppies are really good for a lot of sweat bees and bumblebees and some honeybees. The yarrow is a, another plant that we, this particular one we don't recommend, it's the native, but the one that's yellow, that's in full flower right now, that's the good one. Manzanita, I've already mentioned. Um, take a look also at this incredible bee here with long mouth parts. It can reach into the flower very nicely. And uh, it has used the proboscis like a straw and sucks out the nectar. Here's another plant that we highly recommend that people use. It's very, very attractive to wide diversity of bees, particularly bees that are easy to see. Now this, this flower is Calendrinia. And um, it's extremely easy to grow. It's a succulent. And uh, honeybees like it. And all the native bees like it. Very good plant. And once it gets started, it doesn't need a lot of water. Ceanothus, I've already mentioned the California lilac. 
Um, Grindelia, the gum flower, very good. Globemello, this is a Sphorousia species, comes from Southern California, but also grows very nicely in Northern California. Very good for a, a huge number of bee species. Now this is another plant that we like a lot. It's from North Africa. This is called Vitex agnus castus. This is probably one of the best plants that you can grow for a variety of reasons. Once it gets started, for example, it'll attract a huge variety of different kinds of bees, including honeybees, including bumblebees, including carpenter bees, and including these small carpenter bees. So it's the list of positive things about this plant are really good. It'll grow to 25 feet if you let it. But most people that have learned to use this plant usually top it off at about eight feet. And it, it takes to pruning really well. And each year it'll produce a huge crop of flowers. And here's one of the small carpenter bees that you'll find on it. We list all these plants that we've worked with and we've tested in our website, helpabee.org. And you can take a look at those if you want. And, uh, if some of them um, you're wondering about, you can always write to us and we can give you a little more information. We continue to add um, information to our list once we uh, learn more and more about the plants. Uh, you should have some water for these some of these bees. Now, of course, honeybees need water, but there are a number of native bees that need a little water, not so much for drinking, but they use the water to soften the dirt, for example, they make trips back and forth with water in their crop and they spit it out on the, on the um, dirt and this allows them to dig into dirt that they would otherwise not be able to because of the dryness. Most bees uh, get their, their water source from nectar, but um, honeybees, of course, have a different use for water and they're, they're, um, they need water. If you want to try to provide some shelter for bees where they can make nests, you can also uh, drill a bunch of holes into wood, certain sizes, and you can put them out in various places. And the bees are really quick to find these places, but they'll also attract other kinds of things as well. So you have to be uh, you know, vigilant about this and you have to look and clean these things out once in a while because you get wasps in there, you get flies in there, you'll get earwigs, that they love those holes. But you'll get a lot of bees too. So we call these bee hotels or bee condos. Other tips. Um, you should uh, clean out these um, bee condos once in a while because they get gummed up with a lot of junk in there and you can just drill them out with a, with a drill. Uh, we also uh, ask people to plant large patches, patches that are Oh, somewhere between um, three to four, three to uh, three to five feet square of the same species. And we also suggest that people plant different types of species in the in the garden, so you'll have flowering all year long, because you have bees that come out at different times of the year, and that you need to take care of them. And some bees have more than one generation, and some bees just have a long seasonal period altogether and they just need to have food all during the year. Avoid pesticides. Avoid a lot of mulch over the entire garden. Um, it's okay around the plant, but not around the whole entire garden because bees have to dig down through this stuff and they won't dig down through a lot of mulch. So if you can leave an area for ground nesting bees, that's good. Or maybe you have a, a messy ne a next door neighbor and that's good too because then they'll nest over there. So this is just an example of a garden that you could put together and um, you can make your own design. Again, we recommend 15 to 20 different species of, of plants so that they provide resources year round. Okay, and this is one of our really nice bees that's emerging at this time of the year and making nests. And also um, it's a ground nester. It's a really nice digger bee. So thanks very much. And if we have some questions, we'll try to um, answer them. And the next slide will give you an idea that we, if you contact us, uh, we'll have, we have resources that we can put your way. 
And here's some of the sources that we use. So we'll see if we can take some questions now. Uh, I think Sarah is going to, you probably have a few that you jotted down. Yeah. Hi, Gordon. Um, some people asked a few questions in the chat. Uh, one of the questions was how much of our crops would be pollinated in the U.S. without honeybees? Well, I think you can easily say that plants that don't need um, insect pollinators will be will be okay. Things like corn and uh, wheat; these are things that uh, don't require an insect visitor. Um, things like um, <laughs> grapes. I wish they were pollinated by insects, but they're not. They're self-pollinating. But there's a variety of uh, plants that can that can sp survive okay without without uh, bees but just think of all the plants that need the bees so your diet would be down limited down to a, a very small handful of things that um, uh, would get pretty boring without the uh, the activity of bees producing the kinds of uh, fruits and vegetables that we have today Another question was, um, how does Hylaeus pollinate if it carries pollen in its crop? Well, that's a good question because this is one of those kinds of insects that doesn't have a lot of hairs on its body. However, as I mentioned before, pollination is the act of contamination. And if you have a lot of these little bees out and these bees are moving around and getting, they're getting uh, pollen uh, even a little bit stuck here and there on their body, uh, they can be effective pollinators. It doesn't take a lot of pollen to um, to actually set up a fertilization of a plant. So the activity of bees moving around, even things like wasps that come in, they don't seem like they have anything on their body that would attract um, pollen. But if you were to take that wasp and if you were to dab it with some sort of a material and you would pull off the pollen, you find out that even wasps carry pollen and even little little uh, beetles carry it and flies for sure carry it. But the quantity is very small and our, our next project that we have in mind is to evaluate some of these pollinators or these visitors and see how many of them might have some pollinator capacity. And this is work that is very tedious. There's a few few groups of people that have done this kind of work in the past, but now since we're beginning to realize that we might not have all the bees we want in the world, especially honeybees in the future, the question is, what about the native, what about the native bees and what about all these other things that visit flowers? And that's where our research is taking us currently. So the question about um, crops uh, how much of the crops would be pollinated in the U.S. without honeybees? What I think was specifically uh, asking about honeybees. Um, if honeybees were gone, how much uh, would the native bees be able to um, pollinate without the presence of honeybees? Is that is that yeah, what the person was asking? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, that's a really good question because you know, to a scientist, we'd like to be able to test that idea. In other words, if you didn't have any honeybees around and you had only native bees to call upon, would they do the job? Well, first of all, honeybees are not even native to the new world uh, and native bees are. So in some of the, the growers that we work with, they're getting they're getting tired of paying high prices for renting honeybees. Some of them are actually not using honeybees anymore. They're just depending upon native bees. Some of the cherry growers in California uh, tell me, and these are all anecdotal stories. These are these are fodder for us to work on for research in the future. They're telling me that bumblebees, for example, uh, have played a great role in pollinating their cherry flowers in the past, and currently they're doing the same thing. So we still have a lot of work to do with what happens if we don't have honeybees. A lot of researchers will tell you that probably you don't even need honeybees to do a lot of the pollination and native bees are doing a substantial amount of it. Some people have tried to make estimates of how much 
that they can do uh, without the honeybees being around or not the honeybees playing a role. And the numbers vary tremendously from something like 9 to 40 percent. Um, that's one study. Uh, something else that's really interesting about um, that issue is that um, uh, the native bees, if you're going to be dependent upon native bees, you have to be prepared to take care of them. And uh, native bees, in addition to visiting things like uh, the, the crop flowers that you want, are also very good at util utilizing weeds and weed species. So, for example, we're also, we're also telling our growers that you don't have to eliminate every weed that's out there in the field. Those weeds are actually are actually providing food in the form of pollen and nectar for those um, for those native bees, and they do it all year long. Another question was um, that valley carpenter bees uh, vary in size. The person asking asking the question has seen them vary in size, and. Uh, why are some larger than others for the valley carpenter bees? Well, first of all, the valley carpenter bee is one species, and then there's another species that also is a, is smaller, but uh, can be confused if you don't see them side by side. So there is more than one species out there doing some work. And um, there are smaller size bees, and there are uh, larger size of the second species. So. There's variation in, um, in, in, within the species. And th this is a very interesting point to make also with regard to bumblebees. Um, if you look at the bumblebee literature, there's a lot of variation within a given species. Not all species have the same banding of, of hairs and color in the hairs. The, some of them, they vary tremendously from location to location and also depending upon where in an area that the, the bee has been, has been established. So we have a lot of we have a lot to learn about the variation within these plants and what what uh, the variation is actually serving to do. So uh, variation is an issue that um, is okay. Now that brings up another point. Sometimes people say, "Well, um, when do baby bees become bigger bees?" <laughs> we always like that question, and uh, that's when we tell people something about the biology of a. Um, of a holometabolous insect that once they become adults, that's it. They're not going to grow anymore. Another question was, um, sorry, one minute. Um, do sorry, just finding this here. Uh, does do honeybees significantly displace native bees, or is there enough diversity in plant resources to support honeybee cultivation and native bee populations? Well, that's a really good question, and it varies as to the where you answer that question and under what conditions. And the reason I say that is because it's always been assumed and feared by um, honeybee people that native bees. Um, maybe actually um, putting pressure on honeybees and maybe not allowing them to, be, to make, make their full uh, claim on the pollen and nectar. Turns out that the recent literature indicates it's just the opposite, that honeybees actually intimidate native bees. And if you think about a scenario like this, where you have a lot of hives in a given area and the, bee, and the honeybees are out there in full force and they're taking nectar right and left and pollen, there's not much left for the native bees, so they'll go elsewhere. And that's what all these recent studies have indicated, that it's the honeybees that are actually impacting the native bees by pushing them out. And some of this may be through just interaction among the bees themselves, although you don't see much in the way of fighting amongst bees. But in terms of the pollen and nectar, if there's not pollen and nectar there, the native bees are going to leave. So. We need some education here that um, when you have a, an area that's just filled with honeybees and you're thinking, where are the native bees and are they doing something to the, the honeybees? Uh, it's, you have to ask yourself, um, 
about whether or not these um, these studies that indicate the the impact of um, honeybees on native bees is is showing that these things really um, don't exist too well together, especially in large numbers. Another question was, what's the ideal diameter hole size for bee condos? Well, we use 3 16 of an inch. We use quarter inch and we use 5 16 That takes care of just about all the bees that you can deal with. There are some bigger hole sizes, but the, the bees coming to them are rare. There are some smaller hole sizes, and those bees will take care of things like little holes in pith or in little little tiny holes that are made by other insects. But the ones we use, the ones that work the best for us are 3 16 1 quarter, and 5 16 And we use redwood or any other wood actually is probably pretty good as long as it doesn't have a lot of uh, resin in it. Um, so we dug for redwood. Those are the, the woods that we use. Another question was about uh, the territoriality of bees. And the person asking the question says that they have a native plant garden uh, with many types of bees visiting flowers, but honeybees hardly go near it. Um, are the other bees keeping them out? Well, I'd have to see the situation to be to be, give you a good answer to that. But um, some of these um, some of these male bees, like the the wool, wool carter bee, will chase everything. It'll even chase humans. And um, we actually had a student that was was had one bounce off of her face, off her nose. So um, they're um, they're pretty aggressive, and they will chase bees, and they'll chase honey bees. And uh, honeybees will just usually move to another flower, or sometimes they'll just move completely away. But not all bees are chasers. I mean, <laughs> you know, some of these bees are very specific at where they set up territories. And um, you just have to watch to see how they're distributed in your, in your garden. We don't see that kind of a problem. And then a lot of these um, bees, these, um, the, native, the male bees, have particular places where they do their, their territoriality uh, behavior. So I don't think that's much of a problem, but it's an interesting problem. It's interesting to watch them because they are territorial and they're preparing for, for mating is what they're really doing. And oftentimes they, they do territorial displays with each other like luck behavior in birds. Another question is, uh, what is the ideal type of environment for yellow-faced and black-tailed bumblebees to overwinter in? Um, do they need wet or dry soil? And how deep do their nests go? Well, um, that's very interesting. First of all, um, yellow-faced bees are strictly ground nesters. The, um, the black-tailed bumblebee, the um, Bombus melanopygus, uh, will go into a number of different places, usually into places that have already been cleared out ahead of time. And, and the same thing goes for the yellow-faced bee. They look for places that have already been occupied by something else. And, and a lot of these Bombus melanopygus bees will go into old bird nests. So we get calls from people saying, my bird nests have bumblebees in them. <laughs> it's always the same bee. So um, you can provide a provide uh, melanopygus with a lot of bird boxes. I mean, we actually have a person out in Walnut Creek who has about four or five bird nests, uh, um, sorry, um, bird boxes set up. And there's always one or two of those boxes every year that will be occupied by these bees. Now, in terms of um, what you can do for a yellow-faced bee, it just selects where it wants to go. We have no control over that. And um, we still have a lot of work to do. If you were to, if you read the really fine book that came out a few years ago, I think 2014, uh, that had a lot of four authors, and one of them was Robin Thorpe on bumblebees, um, the authors make very clear that there's still an awful lot of unknowns about the biology and ecology of most of the bumblebee species. So we still have a lot to learn about them. 
We have another uh, bumblebee question about, can bumblebees in a bird nest be relocated? Well, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, these little, these um, bumblebee nests in birdhouses, usually you, you discover them after they're well along in their, in their um, occup occupation of this nest, which is temporary, of course. And um, we never tried to do that. Um, a lot of the questions that, you're, that people ask, by the way, are questions that um, we don't always um, think that we can get funding for to test. Now, I'm not sure, maybe you can find some private donors who would be willing to, to help support something like that, but this could be something that, that could be done. I mean, I think Robin Thorpe was, was the person who did these kind of things and tried some of these things. I don't know what he found out, though. Uh, because he didn't publish a lot of his work on bumblebees. But I'm assuming that you can take the nest and you could move the nest box someplace else and the bees would find it because they, they uh, have a great sense of smell and a great sense of being able to get back to it. Whether or not you could actually open up a bee box or a bird box, take the nest out and move it someplace else, uh, it's doubtful, but we haven't done it, so I don't know for sure. We have another question. Do you think that bee sorry, do you think that beekeepers should limit our density somehow in order to make sure pollen and nectar resources are available for native bees? If so, what do you think is the best way to do this? Well, now that's a really good question. And uh, I think we're going to be able to get answers to that kind of a question. Uh, in our work with avocado pollination. We're working in Southern California now with avocados, and we're also doing a lot of things with avocados that haven't been done before, one of which is to figure out how frequently honeybees come to the avocado flowers and how frequently all these other visitors. There are 60 species of insects that visit avocado flowers in Southern California alone. And uh, half of these are native bees. The other half are flies, wasps, and a few beetles. And we're going to be able to, through visitation counts and through, through some other methods, we're actually going to be able to tell you how the, um, what portion of what, what groups of, of, of insects are actually contributing to pollination along with the honeybee. Now, the other interesting thing about honeybees is, if you, you may know this, um, avocados need to have pollination by insects. Honeybees don't even like the flowers of avocados, but they're forced to use them because the growers put these boxes out there, the hive boxes out there, and there's nothing else for them to eat, so they take it. But people have tested honeybees and as to their attraction to avocados and find out that they're not very attractive at all. The native bees are, and we're going to be able to find out that sort of question or address that question when we do these visitation counts and find out just how many things are out there that are that are actually using the avocado flower? We think that a lot of the pollination in avocado plants is done by native bees and native insects in general. The other issue that's very interesting was the work just came out of New Zealand that the workers down there discovered that in addition to the diurnal pollinators or the diurnal visitors, there's also nocturnal visitors and lots of them that come out at night and visit avocado flowers that remain open at night. Now, this is something brand new that just came out a few years ago. We think that the conditions in New Zealand and California are about the same, and that we're gonna be out there at night watching to uh, check for um, visitors that come in at night. This could actually double the amount of pollination that goes on. The, the visitor list that they generated in New Zealand was huge, more than would come out during the daytime. And of course, none of those visitors were bees. They're all things like little wasps, uh, moths, beetles, and a bunch of other groups of, uh, of insects. No bees. Does anyone else have questions? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself.
Any other questions for Dr. Frankie? Uh, yes, I've got a question. Um, we heard that uh, mason bees are um, about 50 times more effective at pollinating than honeybees for fruit trees. Um, why would that be, and is it true? Oh, I think I think native bees, such as mason bees, are well known to be more more um, effective as pollinators. Um, they just they visit in different ways, and they are also they're also just pre adapted to visiting flowers that we put out there that are of the prunus type, and they can just visit a lot of flowers, and they they're more they're just they're more industrious and they're more effective as pollinators, and you don't need as many of them. I don't remember what the ratios are for the ones that have been studied, but I think it's something like, Sarah, I think you probably know the number, something on the order of about 100 times more effective as pollinators than, than honeybees, some of these native bees, such as the mason bee, and some of the other bees, the alkali bee, for example. But if you're gonna, if you're gonna deal with those native bees, uh, you have to be prepared to manage them. You have to be prepared to provide them with, with a home. And that's where, that's where a lot of problems come in. And that is people, we've done the research, we know what, what you can do if you want to, but, but growers take the easy way out. They just say, bring in more honeybees. That's what they've done with the, the almond orchards in California. They just overwhelm these orchards with um, honeybees and they bring them in from everywhere, including used to be anyway, Australia. But there's, there's this huge shift of bees that come in from out, from other places in the United States into California during the uh, avocado, the almond um, flowering. But I think the native bees are just haven't, we haven't really, haven't really tested them well enough to know for sure what they can do. And a lot of my, my colleagues indicate that in many of the crops that they work with, native bees can do the job better than honeybees. But those are anecdotal uh, observations. So I had a question about um, the uh, the hotels. I had read that you need to cycle out hotels, like um, after a season, you know, take the the housing down, and um, I'm not sure what you do with it, but you put out a fresh house um, for the following season. Um, do you do you recommend? Uh, cycling out um, bee hotels or what What should you do? Or do you, should you just drill everything out and clean it out and reset it out? Yeah, that's a good question because there's always somebody still nesting in there. You're not really sure if it's a wasp or a bee or what it is. And But uh, we, what, the way we do it is once a year. And um, you can let them go for a couple of years. But if you want to clean them out, that means you're going to have to drill them out. That's the way we do it with a hand drill and clean them out, let them dry out, and then we put them out again. Or you can just get no, new wood. Sometimes what we do is we just take the wood that's been filled up with these, you know, a mixture of things like uh, bees, wasps. There's a lot of mud wasps out there. Um, earwigs, spiders. There's a number of things that go into these, these nests, and we just take the old nests and take them out to the woods someplace where they can be recycled naturally. And then we put brand new ones out. Now we just do that on an experimental basis, not on a large, large scale basis where, you know, somebody might want to do that as a grower. There are, um, there is research that's been done on that, especially out of uh, Utah. Uh, you can check the Utah lab there. They have a native bee lab there. They'll also be uh, willing to help you with that. Uh, you can ask for Dr. Jim Kane. And um, he can probably help you uh, sort that out a little bit. I think everybody does it a little bit differently. I think that's the best way to answer your question. We do it with the idea that once we use these sticks, we'll put them out someplace where they can be recycled naturally and let things emerge on their own. And then we just put new ones out. And then we watch a lot. We monitor a lot to see what goes in them. And uh, we do the same kind of work in Costa Rica where I do a lot of some of my other work. But in Costa Rica, we have to use bigger holes. <laughs> when you use bigger holes, you never know what you're going to get. We actually had frogs, little tiny frogs living in some of the big 
the big holes in our in our, our bee condos and then big uh, katydids. So there's all sorts of things that, that start coming into your holes once you create these little habitats. Because that's what you're doing. You're creating habitat. And it's wonderful. But you have to be prepared for the fact that you're going to get a whole bunch of new visitors coming in. Not just your target visitors. So I, I guess what I'm, really, I'm really saying to you all is that... Um, <clears throat> You know, you can have a lot of fun doing this kind of work. You don't always have to be so serious. And I know you have you you thinking about the bottom line a lot of times, but on the other hand, there's an awful lot of really fun things to to observe and to kind of get involved. And this guy, I forgot his name, Talame from back east, I think in New Jersey. He wrote a book called Bringing Nature Home. And uh, it's a really good book. And it's it gives you an idea of what you could do if you're really willing to to um Watch a little bit, think a little bit, and maybe enjoy something that you hadn't thought you could enjoy. And whatever you do, don't use chemicals, please. I mean, chemicals that are harm that are known to be harmful. Does that answer your question about the about the uh, bee condos? Yeah. Okay, and it's up to you what what your goals are with them. If you want. If you really want to have bees come in and you know when to put them out and the best time to put them out, of course, is um, in the in the um, late winter, early spring, you'll get a nice crop of, of bees coming into them, especially if you have wild habitat nearby. And especially if you have some water in the area that's got mud, you'll have nesters that will make them out of mud. So that's a good thing to keep, keep in mind as well. You get a lot of diversity. So it sounds the, like the other thing that I can say about diversity coming into these areas is some people say, well, gee, if uh, if 10 nests can do this, maybe I'll put 100 out. Maybe I'll put 500. Maybe I'll put 1,000. But if you start doing that, you're going to start attracting enemies. You're going to start attracting wasps that are parasitic. You're going to start attracting lots of other organisms that you probably don't want. We try to tell people to be modest about using those condos. You know, I think maximum number I would put out in any place would be 100. 50 might even be better. Just spread them around. We have a question about uh, where is the best placement <clears throat> for Basin B hotels? Where's the best place? I'm not, I'm not, sure, not sure I understand that question. Uh, that question place. was for me because um, I was just, uh, I actually got um, one of these little bee hotels is for mason bees. And um, my daughter sent me some mason bee cocoons to hatch them out and they actually never hatched out. But I thought that they should be able to attract um, just local bees to come and live there. But um, it's uh, for the past two seasons, it's never had any bees living in there. Okay, I can probably tell you a little bit more about that. Um, <clears throat> first of all, when you set these um, trap nests or these bee condos out, we usually have blocks of about 10 or ten or 12, you know, wrapped up in a bundle. And uh, we drill a stick out lengthwise, and we wrap them up in bundles of, of 10 to 12. And then we hang them in trees, usually at eye level so we can see things, but they've got to be in the shade. You cannot have any, any contact with the sun. Or they'll cook the bees or cook the insides. And it's better to be in a place that's, that's you know, if you really want to, if you want to test out something, you, you, what we do is we try out places that are, uh, that we think might be okay. And then the bees will tell you whether they like them or not. So the second year is when you learn something and you can put them in a better place. But for sure, hang them in a tree, hang them in a place where there's lots of vegetation around, where there's always shade. Okay. And then you action. Now, the other thing I can mention to you, interestingly enough, about this issue is uh, a lot of the uh, uh, palm and stone fruit growers in the Brentwood area, for example, uh, have these old trees, these old um, orchard trees. And these old orchard trees have these old crummy looking trunks, but they're just great places for bees and they make nests in those, in those old trunks. And we get some of the best successful um, uh, Nesting, nesting in our bee condos in the by hanging our our, our bundles on top of the uh, alongside of those trees. 
So, you know, don't look for something smooth and clean and neat. Uh, the bees are messy, messy. They'll go to places that you wouldn't even think about. So you, I, I mean, one season of trying this thing out, and the following season you'll be educated. You'll know more where to put these things. All right, is there any other questions for Dr. Frankie? Yeah, I'd like to ask some more about the um, cleaning out or the cycling out of the um, condo holes or the condo containers. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that if a bee lays a, um, an egg uh, in, in April, that it'll take about a year until it'll come out again. Another bee might do that in May or, or later. And so when is a good time to do it without, without the danger of destroying whatever work they've done the previous year? Well, let, let me answer the question in a way that won't be completely satisfactory. But let me tell you that there's so many different types of, of uh, bees that will, will use those condos that you have to be prepared of the variation. Now, some of these some of these uh, trap nests can be hung out very nicely. <clears throat> excuse me, in um, late February, especially with climate change, things are getting warmer all the time. I'd say put your first batch out in late February, and you can expect a number of bees to come in and begin nesting there, probably in March, April, and then the following year. Sometimes they'll come out the same year or. Or the following year, you may have to wait for them to come around. Uh, we always put out a number of different uh, uh, bee condos to make sure that we get enough um, out there so that we're going to get some kind of action. But keep in mind that every bee has its own particular behavior. It has its own particular way of building nests. It has its own particular time of nesting and seasonality and so forth. And that's the reason why we have 1,600 or more different species of bees in California. They all do different things. And that's the challenge for a lot of us in science, and that is to figure out some of the ones that have patterns that are repeatable, or the ones that are unique, and what kind of a pattern do they have, what kind of seasonality do they have. And um, it's a challenge. And there will be some that will ne won't nest until, uh, until the early summer months. So you'll have these kinds of variations to deal with if you want to use trap nests or if you want to use the uh, the bee condos. Yeah, but that doesn't answer the question. Uh, you say that once a, once a year you clean them out. How do you decide when to clean them out so you don't interfere with the, with, with the bees? Like I, like I said, if, it depends if I want to re recycle or not. Uh, sometimes I don't want to recycle. I think uh, what I mo mostly prefer to do is to use the same use the same sites and take the um, um, the condos and put them after one year of use put them out someplace where they'll, they'll be disintegrate naturally and usually I go to a, a state park or someplace and put them out without telling anybody and they just they just become part of the um, the environment there because these are small sticks they're small bundles they're not a lot and then I put brand new ones out. Now, some people may want to use the same ones over and over again. So you, if you're going to start to clean them out, you have to be prepared for the fact that you might actually kill some of the bees or wasps or whatever is in there when you start drilling after a year or so of use. Uh, the other thing I can mention to you as well is during these drought times, some of these bees hold over for two or three years before they'll actually emerge. So you may want to hold these May, during drought conditions, you may want to hold these bee condos over for two, three, four years maybe before the bees actually come out. Mm -hmm. They have the capacity to they have the capacity to hold over under drought conditions. And if you're out sampling bees like I do, <clears throat> you'll notice under these conditions, like right now I was up in Hopland sampling, and there's not a lot of bees out. They're holding over. Now they can hold over for a number of years, but then there has to come a time when, when uh, things change and then they 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 survive and then they um, emerge, and uh, you just wait for the next big rainy season before you can 
recycle before you see recycling on natural recycling. So keep in mind, three years is not a long time for a bee to stay in a nest. We have a question about if bee condos should be placed face facing east. <laughs> well, I make my bee condos face every which way with the idea that somebody's going to like it one way and somebody's going to like it the other way. And I can't tell you what the bees like until you set these things out there. And the ones that we've worked with in the past, the bees figure out what they like and they, they just tell you by uh, occupying a nest in a, in a certain orientation. And we use small bundles. These bundles are not more than about seven inches in length. And we tie them up with, the, with masking tape and wire and hang them in a tree. And we have holes sticking out either which way. We alternate. And usually what happens is we can't tell if there's a pattern of one side or the other, east or west or north or south. I guess what I'm really also suggesting to you is that one of the things that we think is, is one of the best ways if you want to help bees is try to establish gardens that are very diverse, that have all kinds of pollen and nectar sources, and then watch your bees come into these, these areas. And the bigger the, the bigger the resource, the more bees that you can expect. And we've been working with, a, with a, one of the growers out in um, Brentwood, and he, his daughter had a beautiful garden in the back of her house and we went out there and it was just full of diverse there's diverse um, plants and diverse bees like we'd never seen before but it was because there was so much together in one place so that's the reason why we say don't don't be skimpy if you're gonna you want to attract bees put out food and lots of it and that's where you put out a lot of flowers don't don't put a plant here and a plant there and mix them up people always say well, should i mix them up or should i keep them separate i say Keep them in separate. I mean, t put all of your calendrinias together. Put all of your, your sage, your bra brandiggy sage together. And then you'll get the bees and they'll stay there. And then you'll be able to see a lot of action and you'll be doing a whole lot much better if you uh, leave them alone, let them work and, let, and watch them and they'll tell you what to do next. We think people that work with bees ought to be spending time to watch them, not trying to figure out how they can fit into their, their preconceived ideas or notions. And uh, doing that, watching where they go. I mean, for example, I, I'll just give you some little stories here because it's going to carry on. But uh, when I work with native plant people, they're hard to work with, especially the purists, because they're always telling you, well, we want to use native plants and we want to use the plants from this area, blah, 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 blah. I said, well, what are the bees telling you? And they look at me like I'm crazy. And then I say, well, what you ought to do is watch what the bees do and then follow them. For example, if bees like lavender, put lavender out there, even though it's from another, another part of the world. If they like salvias and you don't have it, they're not native here, put them out. Uh, there's all sorts of plants. Like, for example, the best plant that I can give you the advice on is the uh, Vitex plant. It's from North Africa. Bees love that plant so much, and you can make that thing grow just about any place once you get it started. And you'll get you'll get 15 different species of bees throughout the year coming to the tree of that plant. Where you, do you where do you get that plant? Well, you call your nursery up and say, "Get me a Vitex." <laughs> <laughs> um, I I don't know if you're all familiar with um, uh, the nursery that I go to all the time. Um, is the um, Devil's Mountain Nursery in San, Ro San Ramon. But all the nurseries have these, these plants. They'll get them for you. I never have trouble getting Vitex. And if you have trouble and you get frustrated, you can always call me. And I've always got an extra Vitex in my, my lath house that I can give you. But they're wonderful. The other thing nice about the Vitex is that you can, um, if you cut the flowers off, uh, they'll produce a whole new set of flowers, especially if you give them water. They'll flower three times at least during the season if you um, if you treat them right. They love water to get started, and they love fertilizer to get started. 
And after that, they're on their own. They establish and that you don't even need to do anything with them. They'll just keep producing flowers. And you like it because they also, they're also good for, for honeybees. Honeybees, bumblebees, carpenter bees. Oh, the teddy bear bee likes that plant as well, by the way. Do you know if they have any boron tolerance? I have high boron in my soil water. Oh, boy. I, I, I can't answer that question. I don't know. I've never worked with soils that have boron. I don't know. Try it. Yep. Will do. Thank you. All right. Is there any other question for Dr. Frankie? Well, Dr. Frankie, okay. definitely, definitely appreciate your time. This was a very informative and great, uh, great presentation. Well, if, if in the future, if you want more information on, on bumblebees, um, I'll have a little more time to research it out a little bit better. But, you know, uh, with Dr. Thorpe being gone, he was my major source of information on bumblebees. But there are other people out there that are beginning to spend more time with bumblebees. So we can do more in the future if you really want more of a bumblebee talk. And uh, But I just need a little more time. Thank you so much. It was a great talk. Thank you. And Sarah as well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, uh, giving us a very nice uh, evening. Okay, happy to do it. I, if, if we did this in person, it'd be so much better, but that's how things go these days. So um, I could show you the inside, I could show you the specimen. The other thing I should tell you about is that it's okay to show you pictures like I'm showing you right now, but you know, when we work with growers, we bring them specimens, we bring them big blow up images so they can see things and they'll say, well, what does this small carpenter bee look like? How, how do I tell what it looks like? And then we'll give them characteristics. We'll actually give them small little flip card booklets with all the photographs and descriptions. And the more you work with growers, the more they get used to uh, looking more than they've looked in the past. So that's a good thing. Actually, I thought your presentation had a lot of stuff for visual um, understanding. Thank you for that. Yeah, well, I have to also remark that um, my, um, my good colleague, Dr. Roland Coville, who's also a co-author in our book, is just an absolute expert at close-up photography with all of his uh, knowledge. And um, each one of those images there probably was preceded by 50 other yep. images to get to that point. He, he seems to think he's got about 1.5 or 2 seconds to get, a, get an image of a bee. And at the end of a day of uh, photographing all day long, if he gets two images that he thinks are OK, he's really happy. And, but he's been doing this for years. And what you're seeing and what I showed you today is the work that he's been doing for the past 25 years. Awesome. Really good stuff. Thanks very much. And we'll, uh, we should try it again sometime when we can do it in person. And uh, even if we even if we have to wear a face mask, it would still be better in person. <laughs> so, thanks a lot. Bye now. That's good. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.